it with the diagnosis giving him hope. So hope is a very real thing. And when you study people that die really quick after a diagnosis versus those that don't, it's hope. You can boil it down. One had no hope, one had hope. Isn't that interesting? That's why your faith, your hope, must be anchored to faith, according to Hebrews. So yes, I mean, but anyway, I wanted to share that with you guys because I've never had that, and I think it could probably apply to sicknesses uh, as well as mental diagnoses that people get. Okay, so let's see, back to it. Okay, stop. So stop sin. Draw upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is the power for transformation and the Word. Jesus is not only faithful to forgive you, but He'll also cleanse you from all unrighteousness, meaning that you're washed in the blood and the consciousness of guilt is removed. Okay, now, for a lot of people, there's not even any actual sin that they're doing. They're just living in a sin consciousness. Okay? And top it off with false doctrine that you're still a sinner, you know, and now you've got a recipe for disaster. All right. Oh, the two natures doctrine, which we've talked about, or they feel that they have to observe the law. In 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says the sting of death is sin, and the power, the supernatural power is what that is in the Greek word uh, of sin is the law. Uh, in Galatians 5, 4, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now the context here is the Torah, Moses' law, but a lot of Christians, including pastors, make up their own laws, right? And then they wonder why their congregation is full of a bunch of people sinning. The worst thing that you can do to stop doing something is to create a law. Because it will actually empower. That's why diets don't work. So I tell people, don't diet. You're, you're telling yourself you can't have. It's a law. That will actually empower sin. Instead, you have to phrase it, I choose life. I choose to eat the things that are fuel for my body. That's every day. Every day I may say no to something I want to eat, but it's not because it's law. It's because I have the power to choose what I put in my body, and because it's Holy Spirit's home, I'm going to feed it well. And that's what I do. That's, I think, been one of the sustaining things that I have. Plus, I always have a plan. You know what I'm saying? If I know I'm going to be around some stuff I want to eat that I don't need to, I either don't eat breakfast or I have my plan where I stuff myself full of goodness before. <laughs> so really, it's just having your plan and knowing it's the power of choice, not law. Have you ever told someone don't think of a pink elephant? Guess what they immediately do? It's the same concept. But here's what's crazy. If you try to fulfill laws, whether it's Moses' laws, your pastor's laws, whatever it is, it says you have fallen from grace if you try to be justified by them. That, that's me scary. Now the context of that is being circumcised. Uh, and again, the word law means uh, Torah. Okay, now with all that out of the way, you got people that try to serve the law, you got people that have a sin consciousness, you got people that are taught they're still sinners, you got all of these things that make people live outside of the reality of the price Jesus paid for them to have. Now, let's look at verse 21 in Hebrews chapter 10. Since we now have a magnificent high priest to welcome us into God's house, we come closer to God. We approach him with an open heart, fully convinced, fully convinced that nothing will keep us at a distance from him. For our hearts have been sprinkled with blood to remove impurity. Oh, and here it is. And we have been freed from a, an accusing conscience. I wish every Christian would get this. We would, we would have so many miracles. So, I mean, entire cities would be taken over. The Lord would probably be here by now. Uh, but, man, this is so good. Our hearts have been sprinkled with His blood to remove, remove impurity. And we have been freed, past tense, we have been freed from an accusing conscience. Now, not in the future, 
now we are clean, unstained, and presentable to God inside and out. Okay. If you feel a, diff a distance from God when you go into prayer or whatever, guess what? You have a conscience accusing you. It's that simple. So whatever it is, it, you just need to tell it to be quiet. You know what I mean? Just tell it to be quiet. Know that you're already made clean and pure and innocent and, and, and press past that accusing heart. Because we learned last week, if anything's going to accuse you, it's actually your heart. Everybody thinks, that, oh, the devil's accusing you. Well, sometimes. But usually it's you accusing you. We give him way too much credit for a lot of stuff. We give him way too much power. Okay. The phrase, we come closer and approach him, are two, two almost exact Hebrew verbs taken from the same root word that contain the idea of offer a true sacrifice. Meaning Jesus is a true sacrifice that was offered for us that allows us to come closer and approach him and then we're able to offer our bodies as a true sacrifice to him not out of works or legalism okay and so that's the idea of Romans 12 1 through 2 where it says beloved friends what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness experiencing all that delights his heart for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you. So, okay, now I want to I pause here. The total reformation of how you think will empower you to discern God's will. Okay, now that's important. It doesn't come from preachers. It doesn't come from anybody else except for a renewed mind. How you think. So you'll discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Okay, so the ability to offer ourselves as a true sacrifice is absent from law and consciousness of sin. We don't need to sacrifice and give to make ourselves feel better. We don't need to do those things. We, he has made us perfect to approach Him. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at uh, verses 23 through 25. So now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us, knowing that God always keeps His promises. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. Not out of guilt, right? This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Okay, so they even had a problem getting people to fellowship back then. If he encourages us to make sure we spend time together almost 2,000 years ago, I'm sure the need is even more great now, right? Okay, now, the hope that lives in us is our eternal life is secure and Jesus Christ is coming back, okay? But also, the expectation of glory, according to Colossians 1.28. Now, out of this hope, we're to be creative, I like that, to encourage others. The word neglect can be abandoned and it implies quote a person who is extremely discouraged okay so if you see someone that's extremely discouraged our job is to find creative ways see I like that creative ways to encourage them to spend time with other believers so that they can get some encouragement now if the group they're with has a bunch of sour face you know Christians that are complainers and jerks then you probably don't want to encourage them to be with them so the company you keep is who you become, right? So you want to make sure it's encouraging people. No negative Nancys and negative Nathans are allowed. Which so far, every Nancy and Nathan I've met, they are pretty negative. They're straighten up, you negative Nancys and Nathans. All right. 
We've all been through trials, and the desire to withdraw at times is very real. Uh, and, and so that's why it's important just to hear Holy Spirit and help one another. Now, here's where I want to go, okay? This is where I want to go. I shouldn't be clapping because it's actually not good. But maybe I'm clapping because we're almost done. <laughs> and you guys, it's time for food. All right. Now, it says in verse 26, okay? So we've got where we're free from an accusing conscience. We're fully convinced that nothing can keep us distance from Him. We are clean from the inside out. We wrap our heart tightly with that hope. We're going to help one another when people are discouraged. Verse 26. For if we continue to persist in deliberate sin after, after we have known and received the truth, there is not another sacrifice for sin to be made for us. But this would qualify one for this certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the raging fire ready to burn up his enemies. Anyone who disobeyed Moses' law died without mercy on the simple evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you suppose a person deserves to be judged who has contempt for God's Son and who scorns the blood of the new covenant that made him holy and who mocks the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, I have the right to take revenge and pay them back for their evil, and also the Lord will judge His own people. It is the most terrifying thing of all to come under the judgment of the living God. Okay, that's where the fear comes in. Now, the word deliberate is very important because a lot of Christians think that it means any sin at all. Okay, but that's not what he's referring to. And I'll tie it together with the accusing conscience. But the word deliberate means voluntarily and intentionally. It refers to sins committed willingly, those done designedly and deliberately in the face of better knowledge. In other words, get this, Paul is referring to those who design their life in order to commit sin. Every decision they make, where their money goes, where their time goes, what they do for pastime, everything is designed to sin, which we just saw that happen and be exposed here in our own city. I can guarantee you every decision that man made was how he could get back to his sin. Okay, So now it's like an obsessive. It's an obsessive. It's, it's intentional. They know they shouldn't be doing it, but they're going to do it anyway. And they're very good at it. Now that's different from a person that maybe feels bound in some type of addiction or is battling some type of sin, whatever it is, but they don't want it. They're, they want to be free, their hearts to be free. That's totally different from a person whose entire life is designed so they can commit this sin. The word knowledge is also important where it says that they have knowledge of God, okay? This word now, there's actually two Greek words for knowledge, gnosis and epinosis. Gnosis is, quote, present fragmentary knowledge. You know, you have part of the picture, part of the story, but it's in fragments and it may be a temporary knowledge that's actually proved wrong later, okay? But epinosis is, quote, a clear and exact knowledge which expresses a more thorough participation in the acquiring of the knowledge on the part of the learner. Okay, what is this? This is a Christian that they they now have an experiential knowledge of God, but they're very active in attaining that knowledge. They're reading their Bible, they're praying, they're you know discussing God things with other people. They're involved in Bible studies and different small groups and things like that. So they're not passively sitting around. Okay? So these are people that have a maturity and yet they intentionally design their life to sin. Okay? It's one thing to have a present and fragmentary knowledge. It's another thing to have a deep knowledge of God and you still choose to sin habitually. Okay? Uh, Zodiati states that it often refers to knowledge with, which very powerfully influences a knowledge laying claim to personal involvement. Okay. Now, 
something happens or has happened where maybe there's past wounding or past things this person's not dealt with and all of a sudden those things start coming up and now they're addicted again or now they're they're struggling but this time there's a greater responsibility what I have found is others become this type of person due to a lack of tenderness to the Lord arrogance and even a psychopathic narcissistic personality okay that's what I have found a lot of people they're very that fall into this I, I, I can think of two and when you look at them they're, they're narcissistic and they're psychopaths which by the way most clergy is a lot of people that's like the number I think it's like number five on the top they know they have professions I'm not sure because, you know, sometimes, and by psychopathic, it doesn't mean they're necessarily a bad person. They just have low empathy, right? Uh, and they're also, psychopaths are very good at manipulation uh, and control. If it's not dealt with in the Lord, uh, I can see them using it for their power. But also, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why a lot of people there in clergy are psychopaths. It's, it's kind of interesting. Well, who's given them their authority? Has God given it to them or man given it to them? Well, I mean, yeah. Jesus could say, well, where'd you get yours? You know, I mean, we it's... Elect them. Yeah, some are elected. Some are just hired. I'm not sure. It's an interesting thing. I mean, I have a high psychopath level on the scale. So, um, I'm not sure why we're attracted to that. <laughs> anyway, but the thing is, is that there's not a tenderness to the Lord. And psychopaths and narcissists have low consciences uh, if they're not careful. So you always want to maintain a tenderness. If you have low empathy or low emotional threshold, you will need to be intentional on in having a tenderness to the Lord. You know, because you can just blow it off or blow him off. Now, here's where it ties to the accusing conscience. I believe that for many who fall into this state that Paul's describing. It stems from an accusing conscience, meaning that because of wrong doctrine and a lack of understanding of the it is finished aspect of Jesus Christ and his impact on our nature, that people develop more faith for the fact that they'll sin than the fact that their old nature is dead. Because what you have faith for, that's what you live. So if you always believe you're going to be a sinner and you always believe that you're going to sin, what power and motivation is there to not? You know what I mean? It's like, well, I remember when I was a teenager, I was accused of doing stuff I didn't even do. And I'm like, fine. Fine. You think I'm doing that? I will. And that's what I did. You know, if people around you don't have faith in you, you probably won't have faith in yourself either. And so, whatever they accused me of doing, I just started doing. It's the same thing. Why would anybody ever think that they can get to a place of uh, freedom from an accusing conscience if they're told that they are guilty all of the time? So to me, when I was studying this, I saw that part of the danger of interacting with God from an accusing conscience is that you might find yourself where you just give up. You might find yourself involved in all kinds of sins because remember, the strength of sin is in the law. That's why a lot of people are in those law sects, 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 <laughs> cults, <laughs> S-E-C-T-S. When, when they're in that, have you noticed how mean and ornery and sin riddled they get? They don't get their way look at Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. And so they are in danger of being in this realm. Let's see. They live from a place of trying to manage the old nature and sin versus believing the old nature is dead. And this mentality will keep us separated from God's presence, even though we don't have to be. And when you're separated from His presence, it's very hard to follow Him and to, you know, be transformed. Remember... We learned that one of the reasons Jesus came was to deliver us from a guilty and accusing conscience. It was crucial because only then could we boldly and bountifully enjoy His presence and fellowship like Adam and Eve. 
You live as you have faith. If you have faith that you are no longer a sinner and your old nature is de dead, you will live for God with the least effort. The least effort. Work smarter, not harder. Okay? If you have faith that you are still a sinner and fighting your old nature, you will live as a sinner. I mean, that's it. All right. Now, I'm going to kick over the final sacred cow. The cost of the pre-trib rapture doctrine. Okay? That's tied to this. And I want to show you how much it's hurt us. I personally believe that we are at what's called an epoch. And those are specific points in history that are great shift. Okay? One of the, like, one of the epochs is uh, we went from, what, stones and things like that to fight battles to the Iron Age where we made weapons. <coughs> then we went to, into the Industrial Age. You know, like, there are different epochs. Well, the same is true with the church, right? We had the restoration of speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Healing in the 40s and 50s. I mean, there's all <coughs> these different things. Uh, uh, prophets and apostles have, are also being restored. So there's different epochs. One of the ones that I believe we're in now is a, a church shift where we are tired of buildings and, and messages and a lifestyle that's not producing legitimate connection with God and one another, uh, all the rules and regulations, I, I believe we're switching from that into house churches and house groups. I think it's been for a while, but COVID has really accelerated that. Okay, here's the thing that is so crucial to get. At the transition of every epoch, it is a guarantee that the enemy has a counterfeit and a doctrine to either minimize or abort what God wants to do. So, for prophecy, you have these crazy nut jobs going into churches they don't even go to, cursing the church and pronouncing judgment, or a city, or whatever it is. I mean, you got, you know, thus saith the Lord stuff, that we don't need to do that. That was, you know, that was done in the Old Testament so people knew which God was talking. So, we got crazy stuff. With the apostles, for a while, you could throw a rock into a crowd and hit an apostle. I mean, everybody was an apostle. You know, it was ridiculous. Um, healing. It was a one-man show. That was the one thing they did not do. They, some of them did, but a lot of them did not equip and train others to heal the sick, right? So there were all these different things. Well, one of the things that caused a lot of damage was a pre-tribulation rapture that, by the way, coincided with the Jesus movement. <clears throat> now, I want to I trace this down. So the Jesus movement, it was, it was definitely an epoch because all of a sudden you had these hippies wearing shorts and flip-flops and, yeah, flowers in their hair and all that, you know, showing up at these, you know, leave it to beaver church, you know, settings, you know. I mean, I'm sure they're like, what is going on? What is going on? Okay. It was a radical move of God in spite of the church. That's how God does it. Often, if you look at the different epochs, He can't even work within His own people. So He has to go outside and do a move. It's like Jesus said, Hey, did you notice that the only one that was healed was Nathan uh, or Naaman, the guy that wasn't even a Jew, and the other lady that fed Elijah or Elisha wasn't even a Jew. Did you notice that? Like he was pointing it out to the religious structure. Hey, did you take note why there was no one in Israel that received the miracles? Because you kill your prophets. That's why. And you're, you're still killing them, and you're going to kill some more of them, but all the blood of every single prophet that this generation, what does he mean? He wasn't speaking just to the Pharisees of that day. He was speaking to the seed of the enemy. And the seed of the enemy loves churches, loves religious structures, and loves pulpits, right? So here God has to go outside of his church structure, and he starts reaching all of these hippies. Okay? And Chris Volatin was telling, he, he was part of it. And uh, at the same time, 
a destructive doctrine was released by Hal Lindsey. And he may be a great man of God, I don't know. But he really, the, the late great planet Earth came out like not long after that, and then he had his, you know, what were they called? Left Behind Jim, series? Jim Lahane. Jim Left Behind series. But I think it was Hal Lindsey, the late great planet yeah. Earth, and then right. LaHaye and all of that. Right. They released a pre-tribulation doctrine theory. Okay, this greatly influenced those that were born again in the 70s, right? Right. Which was at the same time as the Jesus movement. What did it teach? The world was going to hell and fast. But those who believed in Christ would be raptured out of there before the tribulation. Okay, the result was that many who were born again during that time did not go to college. They didn't finish high school. Some didn't even work. They put their lives and their dreams on hold. Some didn't even get married. Because why? We're about to be raptured out here. What does it matter? So they literally pushed pause on their lives. Okay? Yeah. Well, tremendous emphasis to be separate from the world, which is correct as far as sin, but it led to a withdrawal from society at the same time. Mm -hmm. So Christians left government positions, school positions, where they should have been salt, right? They should have been leaven. They all withdrew waiting for the rapture. You even had people that were putting dates on it. Yeah. I mean, the earth is about to be destroyed. Who cares? Here's the thing. At the same time, now tech giants were born. The very, and this gives me the chills, the very technology that probably should have been given to a lot of people that got born again in the 70s that would have stewarded it correctly, God could not give it to them because of a false doctrine that came right out of an epoch where he was going after all of those people. Why? Why did he pick the 70s and the Jesus movement? Why? Because he saw today. He saw that Facebook would shut down everything that had to do with COVID that they didn't agree with. He saw tech being used against people. He saw that all of that would lead to the Antichrist. All of this stuff. And so people that should have received the idea of Facebook, people that should have received the idea from Microsoft, people that should have received the idea for Apple didn't because they thought the world was going to end. Right. Yep. A lot of them big tech hippies mm -hmm. Oh, their education, big educations, they were already, you're right. Yeah. They were already in places. Oh, goodness. Even Texas Instruments, they, they popped out of everywhere. Yes. In, oh, you know. They popped to me, out and joined the hippie group, and they left places. Witty inventions belong to us. But we, for some reason, are scared of those, and we always just let them go to somebody else. So the pre-trib doctrine literally stole from us the technology that could have been stewarded better. I mean, it literally cost us an election. All right, so Mr. Joy, who invented the Internet, which I find very interesting, you got Apple, Microsoft, all of these people, they created these things. How different would COVID be if we had control of that technology? Chris Volatin talked about the fact that we are to be a city on a hill and if the world is getting dark, darker, we're supposed to be getting brighter. And if we're not, then we're hiding under baskets. The more people go to church in the city and churches get bigger, the city gets worse. Right. Okay? So we're at an epoch, right? We're at this epoch. He is doing a church shift. That means we have to be alert to any witty inventions. We have to be alert to any doctrines that would undermine what God is wanting to do, that would isolate, that would separate us from our call to be light in dark places, to be salt, to be leaven in cities. We need to watch that. We need to watch for the weirdness that can come with being in houses. We need to watch from an elitism, well, y'all go to church, you know, I'm not interested in any of that now. We're, you know, we do this over here. You know what I mean? Like, we don't want there to be a division between the ecclesia and churches. We don't want that. Now, it's going to happen in some cases, but there are good churches out there too. You see what I mean? So we've got to be very careful because we're at this epoch and watch for any doctrine that would undermine our future in the plan of God. And so this one doctrine robbed
Christ followers from their role in society in bringing transformation. If we were to look through the lens of heaven at the cost of wrong doctrine to sin, being born again, the end times, we'd probably be astonished and greatly grieved. We need to have a thousand year vision for our city, our state, and our country. Why? Because there's a millennial reign. And I want to build something that where when he returns, it, it lasts through the fire and he can use what I've established during his millennial reign. That's what I want. Because we're going to have to still keep teaching people about Jesus even post-tribulation, guys, in his return. Because there's going to be people that are going to be resurrected. Will be resurrected, not necessarily them, right? And they're going to have kids. And those kids are going to have kids in a thousand years. So we need to establish things that can equip and train them during those times. Don't you remember those days right after the light shined in your hearts? You endured a great marathon season of suffering hardships that you stood your ground. And at times you were publicly and shamefully mistreated, being persecuted for your faith. And at other times you stood side by side with those who preached the message of hope. You sympathized with those in prison, and when all of your belongings were confiscated, you accepted that violation with joy, convinced that you would possess a treasure growing in heaven that could never be taken from you. So don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are designed or destined for a great reward. You need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will, and then you will receive the promise in full. For soon, and very soon, the one who is appearing will come without delay. And he also says, My righteous ones will live from my faith, but if fear holds them back, my soul is not content with them. But we are certainly not those who are held back by fear and perish. We are among those who have faith and experience true life. I mean, this sums it up. In the Aramaic, it says, Faith that fulfills our soul, or faith to the pre preservation of soul. Any fear-based, again, withdrawing from society is a design of the enemy to get us to where we're irrelevant and we now have no place for the technologies that are coming. And guys, there are technologies that are coming that are scary. And we better be involved and we better have some way to... The, here's the thing. The Antichrist is going to come. Absolutely. That is, that's going to happen. The Bible is plain. When? And the level of damage in our city, our county, our state, and our country is dependent on us. So if y'all see any doctrines or any mindsets that are maybe in conflict to try to abort what God is doing in this epoch, let's take note of them. And let's, let's deal with them as we need to. All right? Let's go ahead and pray. Well, Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. Father, it takes wisdom to see doctrines that might conflict with your purposes or try to abort what you're doing in a new season or epoch in history. Because history is your story. So we ask, Father, that you show us any doctrines that are coming out or that might come out or even some that we believe that we've not yet recognized that are in, uh, uh, against what you want to do. We don't want another Jesus movement where right